the industrial revolution started to happen. Think about like what a massive upheaval that must have been. People are like, oh, I, I'm stressed out. I thought I was going to become, I was going to make anvils or whatever. And now I'm a permanent wage slave. It all happened in, within the span of a generation. We're going through this massive restructuring where the traditional way of doing journalism for the last 150 years, within the span of five to 10 years, has been completely flipped on its head. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of That Can't Be Right, a podcast about structural wrongs, cultural oddities, and wild opinions. I am your host, Ryan. A few housekeeping things as usual. Follow along at TCBR Pod on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Full disclosure, I'm really only active on Instagram. It's the most reliable and consistent platform for now. And if you enjoy this episode or any other, please rate, review, subscribe, Apple Podcasts, or Spotify. Today on That Can't Be Right, we're talking about the current state of journalism. I apologize in advance because it might be all over the place. I have so many questions. But first, to welcome my guest, Nathan McDermott, roaming political reporter, formerly of K-File at CNN and BuzzFeed. Fun fact, we went to the same high school. Nathan, welcome to That Can't Be Right. Thank you. I feel very welcomed. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Happy to be here. Yeah. I'm I'm excited. We already spent some time catching up, so no one has to listen to that. Let's get started. I've been so curious about the journalism news reporting space pretty much, I mean, always, but especially like probably in the last six, seven years. But let's start kind of with your journey to journalism from our high school to today. Did you always want to be a political reporter? I'm, I didn't always want to be a political reporter, but I always did want to be a writer or be in journalism. When I was in high school, I was I was on my school newspaper. I was on the school newspaper um, for a couple of years. And I always kind of wanted to, but being from suburban white bread, Cypress, Texas, I basically told myself that's like a really unrealistic goal. And that's not a very responsible thing to aspire for. And so I kind of put those dreams away when I went to college. I think at college I studied international relations, which funnily enough, because that's also not exactly a <laughs> promising industry or degree to get. Uh, so I worked for a couple of years in Washington, D.C., just like random office jobs, nothing related to my major, nothing I was passionate about, uh, some like political firm and then some nonprofit work, but really nothing. It was, they were just jobs and I did them okay, but it certainly didn't stoke any fiery passion in me. And I don't know, I was in a kind of a low state. I think I was around 24 at the time. I'd also very belatedly come out as gay and was in the city, didn't have a ton of friends and was doing stuff I didn't really care about and was just feeling kind of not too great. Somebody was actually dating at the time. He was actually, funnily enough, in journalism, like a local, like a small magazine, and he did editing work there. And it wasn't, you know, a big national publication. It wasn't anything huge that, you know, people would recognize. But just me, I thought it was so cool. I was like, you like do this? I'm like, that's really awesome. I really respect that. And eventually he was like, you know, do you want to do it? He's like, you know, you could. And I was like, oh, I always wanted to, but I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. That's not me. And then long story short, after some back and forth, and he's like, you know, if you want to, you can. And I was like, you know, that's... Sometimes you need somebody to say it and that it's not a ridiculous thing to do. So I started doing freelance work when I was in DC and I had got stories published and stuff. And then I wanted to really make the transition full time because that then it was just a side gig, but nobody wants to really hire a 24 year old or 25 year old as an intern who is in a different career that makes money. And so I, so I did go to grad school for journalism, which I'm careful. I'm very hesitant to recommend because, especially in journalism, well, specifically for journalism, because of everything going on in the industry. But I just had such a hard time myself personally making the career switch that I thought it would, a hard reset would do me well. So I came to Columbia Journalism School up in New York after those bastards waitlisted me, but I eventually got <laughs> in. It was a very, it's very educational year. I don't think it's absolute I don't think it's necessary. And again, I would caution people taking that approach to go to journalism school. Uh, but for me personally, 
it wasn't so much learning about journalism as being around other people who had the same passions as you and who really respected the field, which I think made me appreciate it a lot more and really think that this is like a really important thing. So yeah, so graduated from J school and spent six months freelancing, trying to find things to do. And then luckily enough, I applied for an internship at BuzzFeed, BuzzFeed Politics, to join this team called the K-File, which I did not know anything about. But they're a political reporting team, kind of investigative work, but it's very heavily focused on research and documents and public records. And the funny thing is they didn't hire me. They didn't care that I went to journalism school. And fun fact, most people in journalism will not because most people in journalism don't go to journalism school. Mm -hmm. uh, but they liked me because my first job after college was working at a research firm, firm for politics where I dug through documents. So they're like, oh, okay, you can be an intern for us. And they're like, we don't really care about the journalism school thing. So I did that. And I think I did a pretty damn good job. My first story, my second, I think it was my second day at, at BuzzFeed as an intern. I wrote a story about Ben Carson and he believed that the Egyptian pyramids, this was 2015, mind you. Um, so early, early days, just when like the Republican primary was starting to happen and Trump was just starting to be a who's this guy kind of thing. But I did a story on Ben Carson and his belief that the Egyptian pyramids were not used as tombs for ancient kings, but as grain silos for from the Bible. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I see you making a face I and just, pausing and be like, okay, should I intervene and ask questions? It's a crazy story. This entire, it's a weird industry. <laughs> I knew you were going to say something crazy because I'm just thinking back to 2015 and Ben Carson's entire political run. And it's like, wow, what a way to ruin a legacy. A couple things really quickly. Just like one, I'm so excited that you like made the decision to like, go for it. I think that's a really hard thing. Like even in doing this podcast, right? Like there's so many people that are at that point when you start doing it better, more experience, whatever. So I'm glad you went for it. No, and I really respect that. I mean, right back at you. I think this is really awesome that you're doing this too. This is, I Thank think you. it's one thing that we, like I said, uh, we're both kind of from the same place that uh, just me personally growing up, it was, it was very much, you know, nose to the grindstone, get married, have kids, do work and, you know, mm -hmm. be happy with that. Um, took a different path personally. <laughs> yeah, it's, and that could be a whole episode about just as an aside, like what, how aspirations, noble, wherever you are, they just differ when you leave like your hometown, I think. Anyway, it's interesting that you spoke about like the value of going to grad school for journalism. I feel like everybody that comes on and there have been several people that have come on, have mentioned it, and they said it wasn't absolutely necessary. And I, I think that's, again, could be another episode about like what, like how that structure works, like how it supports people. But I think you're the first person who's made a point. It's just really good to be in community with other people who care as much about the craft as you do. So that's exciting. Uh, and then Ben Carson. Wow. What a guy. Oh, yeah, yeah. I guess I only got about halfway through Nathan's career legacy. Um, but, but yeah, yeah. So that was my first story. And I remember, not to toot my own horn, but as an intern, second day, you know, it made lots of news. It got reported elsewhere, it got covered on like, you know, CNN, TV, lots of other outlets. Um, mm -hmm. And it happened because I was just digging through hours of old Ben Carson speeches. And I was just told, hey, you know, look through this. And if something interesting happens, make a note. And I listened to him and he was like, oh, you know, Egyptian pyramids, they were, weren't, he also, he said, they're not made by aliens like some people think, <laughs> which, you know, is fair. They weren't made by aliens like some people think. He's like, but they mm -hmm. were made as grain silos, like in Joseph and like uh, the story of Joseph in the Bible. And he was, I think, King David's prophet and said, there's going to be seven years of, you know, bad harvest. I could be getting my biblical facts wrong, but I think that was what he was referring to. Mm -hmm. And so I saw that in the speech and I was like, that's weird. And I just made a note and again, a little baby, Nathan just starting out as an intern reporter. I went to my boss who uh, is also still one of my best friends and he's my age. He's a young guy. And I asked him, I was like, Hey, uh, I was like, this is, I don't know if it's a story, but this is kind of weird. Should I write about it? And he's like, Oh God. Yes. He's like, that's an amazing <laughs> story. And, and from that moment on, I never had to really ask those type of questions again because I was like, oh, I was like, yeah, of course it is. I was like, this guy running for president said this. 
it's not even I don't know, weird way of putting it. Yeah, this bizarre but interesting and kind of funny and strange, but it says a lot about him, and it's also enjoyable to read. Yeah, so that was uh, my first story. But yeah, I stayed at BuzzFeed for a bit longer, and then they hired me full time uh, after my internship was over. Yeah, so I stayed at BuzzFeed. My team, there was like four of us on the K file. We were there for about a year, or I was there for a year. They had been there longer than I had. And then my boss on the team, he had been a, he had been one of BuzzFeed's first employees, Andrew Kaczynski. He'd been there for several years. Um, he's still at CNN right now. Basically, he got poached by CNN. This was June, no, like August, September 2016. So just a couple months before the election. Mm-hmm. And it was a really great guy. I really respect him. He said to CNN when they tried to poach him, he was like, you know, that's so great. Because he was really at the face of the team. He um, was kind of a big name in journalism, much, much, much more so than anybody else on our team. So they tried to poach him. And he said, he's like, you know, that's awesome. I'm flattered. He's like, but, you know, I'm on a team and we really do all of this together. And I couldn't do it without my team and stuff. And because at the time, CNN had more money than God. They were like, OK, sure. No problem. Bring them along. Like it was not a hard mm-hmm. sell at all. Um, <laughs> and then it was really nice because at BuzzFeed, I was paid very poorly. Um, and at CNN, I was paid. My salary, I'll just say my salary went up by a factor of a couple um, yeah. which is nice. Yeah. I got to have, you know, health insurance and, you know, save money. So it was nice. And That's yeah, the millennial dream. I know. I know what a, <laughs> what a goal. I was like to be able to occasionally purchase things without stressing about it. Nice. Yes. But, uh, so then I was at CNN for, uh, several years. Our team kind of changed. We added a member, got rid of some members, but I was there and it was a really interesting time. So basically I was at CNN from 2016 to about start of 2021 mm-hmm. and then there were uh these pandemic related layoffs and restructuring and merging and not merging i was part of uh every also a millennial common millennial trope and really common millennial journalism trope i was part of a round of layoffs at cnn that was unpleasant but honestly i fully expected it to happen one thing as much as i was kind of somewhat critical of grad schools for journalism as somebody who went a few years later within some of my classmates, I really knew what I was getting into. I was like, I know this is a dying industry. I have no illusions about becoming wildly successful. If I do, that's awesome. But, you know, I'm doing it because this is what I actually really care about. And I think it's interesting. Um, it's a very, you're always learning in journalism, which is why I loved it, uh, which I was still love it. Yeah. So I fully expected everybody in journalism is going to be part of layoffs at some time. And so I figured it would eventually happen and it happened. And so since then I have been uh, doing freelance work, doing like long-term contract gigs. Uh, I occasionally write pieces for political analysis pieces for the independent. And um, on top of the fun world of also applying for other jobs. So. Which is a job in and of itself. Yes. No, I thank you so much for sharing your journey. We will dive into all of the companies you mentioned But going back to your comments about like it being a dying industry, like you knew what you were getting into and like layoffs in media and tech seem to be a rite of passage and you're kind of at the intersection of both uh, in those roles. I, my question is like you in covering two elections and going back to my experience with journalism, it feels like it's always been a changing and evolving to the point where it's like the layoffs are inevitable pullbacks are inevitable, restructuring is inevitable. What was going on, do you think, like in those newsrooms after you started covering like the Ben Carson story? Like what was going on in those newsrooms and offices as people discuss like how to cover candidates and then specifically like how to cover Trump, like as it became clear he was evident? Because I feel like I remember you, your team breaking some pretty big stories like throughout oh, yeah, the we, election. We, we and covered his- uh- ton of uh ben carson was the first one but i will say trump was the one i i don't know <laughs> god knows how many stories about trump um just are you asking what the internal discussion was about how to cover this you know a radical different type of politician that we were used to is that kind of what you're saying yeah how did you manage that and how did you experience and manage covering such like a radically different person how has that been felt even in his 
I won't say aftermath. He was on TV the other day, but how's it been felt? On, he was on CNN the other day. <laughs> yes, uh, <laughs> we'll get there for sure. <laughs> um, well, at the time, and you know, I will say that I think the method of covering Trump change it hasn't been static. I don't think it was the same in 2015 as it was in 2017 as it was in 2023. And so there was, so it hasn't been, I don't think there's just like one answer. It kind of depends on when in time, but for I'll just speak from my experience and kind of what I saw. I think that especially early on, we were definitely doing a lot of learning as we were going a lot of flying, what's the expression? Flying by the seat of our pants. Yep. Uh, as it were. And I... Oh my god! I remember I found a trove of uh, Howard Stern, like old Howard Stern archives, and mm. Trump used to be like a regular in the '90s when his like you know real estate rep personal personal reputation was like when he was seen as like a huge has been C lister one of the nobody um, whose career was behind him, and it was like a joke in the '90s. He went on Howard Stern a lot, as a lot of jokes in the '90s did, mm. and. And they talked about you know such crazy things like Trump was talking about like how much he loved Princess Diana and how perfect her skin was and his huge crush on her, and he it, it wasn't the most politically heavy discussions, but it was very revealing about especially as it, they talked about women a lot and he expressed his uh, views of women or he's like you know rating women um you know casual misogyny that type of stuff so yep. uh, there was a uh, there was definitely some multifaceted approaches to the coverage because i'll be let's be real some of it, it it's some of it was funny some of it was like ridiculous like howard stern's a comedian and trump he had a successful television career because he does have this like kind of weird trait that is engaging um and so a lot of it was like this guy's kooky and really strange and bizarre. But while I acknowledge that, I will say that at least for my work, for our work, uh, I mean, we we said very explicitly, we're like, oh yeah, he's saying these sexist things. Like he's saying like this is he's he's rating like the women of Desperate Housewives about which one he would fuck. Um, like <laughs> he said like you know this actress needs to have like a paper bag on her head or he's saying like oh you know or we found stories where god what's her name carla bruni the former first lady of france yep. um i did some digging and found like old basically trump was calling in leaks he leaked uh stuff to the tabloids about how him and carla bruni were a thing but he used one of his like pseudonyms and mm. Carla Bruni had to put out statements. At the time, she was a model in France and a singer. She later became First Lady of France during the 2000s. But at the time, she was just some supermodel. And she had to put out statements being like, I don't know who this person is. I've never <laughs> met this Donald Trump man. I don't know why he's saying these things. But literally, I am like in France and don't know who this man is. And he was also putting out rumors that Princess Diana and Charles were planning on getting an apartment in Trump Tower. Like, things that are like, they're like laughably bizarre. But at the same time, I think... We did an okay job of we were like, okay, this guy's like kind of kooky and crazy and bizarre. But also these aren't nothing. They're not just like, oh, what a fun little anecdote. Uh, so I think that is how we did it. Especially as the 2016 election went on and it became, even in even like in a 10 month period, the difference between like summer 2015, like when he came down the escalator, and there was like 17 different people running and like, oh, this is like a very weird election. And then later, once he got the nomination and or even before he got the nomination, when he was really the last couple of primaries in 2016, when he was really encouraging uh, just like violence amongst some of his supporters and being like, oh, you know, if you want to beat him up, it's cool. That type of, you know, violent or violent language that is now incredibly common in politics right. and isn't really that out of the ordinary at all. But yeah, as the election and campaign went on, we focused more less on his personality and his past and more on kind of countering his falsehoods and the uh, kind of, yeah, and conspiracies. I, yeah, conspiracies that he yeah. put out. Like, all this talk about 
you know, Muslims in Jersey City being on roofs celebrating when 9-11 happened. He said stuff like that. Or uh, even even before, way before COVID, uh, I did a story on how he was talking about how autism was caused by vaccines and and these type of things that are now incredibly common in pol- incredibly common on the Republican Party. But yeah, so and I don't think the entire media and I, I, don't, I don't think I know I feel comfortable saying this. The yeah, the rest of the media, some outlets did and some reporters did. Everything is on a case by case basis. I, I will always say when people are like, oh, the media did this, the media did that. I'm like, well, you know, there's like thousands of reporters. And because you saw a headline, you're like, oh, the media does this. Uh, always does kind of bother me. And I think that's a big part is because most people, we don't really have newspaper subscriptions anymore. And people don't have a good chunk of stories that just sitting on their table for to read when they get home or in the morning. Now, it's, when they do come across news, it's usually something on social media. It's a discussion of news rather than the news itself. And I think that allows, makes it a bit easier for the news audience to be a little bit separate from the product itself, which makes it a little bit easier to uh, project. Did you ever think like in the process, again, going from like 2015 to during primary season to before the election, did you ever think like, this is an article that's going to like end his candidacy? Like this is, did you ever have that moment? No, never. I wasn't confident that he would win the election. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, right when he, I was pretty early on thinking he would go he was uncancelable to use today's parlance when he did the i don't like losers john mccain's a loser because he was captured thing and that was really really early on that was like july 2015 that was the only time i thought oh he's done for now Mm -hmm. and that was only a couple weeks into his campaign but right when because i was like you know that's such a sacred totem in the republican party john mccain veterans pow vietnam war you know these are the people that you know, Americans in general, but real Republicans especially, really lionize. And mm-hmm. so when he, you know, took a shot all over that, I thought, okay, you know, this weird little Trump bubble is going to be over. But then once it didn't hurt him at all, I was like, okay, well, you know, if how, how is he going to be able to say anything worse than or more offensive to voters than dumping all over a POW who spent years in being tortured? And so, and I was like, "Oh, if he's this isn't ending him, then I don't believe saying something mean about Jeb Bush or you know, Marsha Harding from the door, <laughs> Carla Bruni or Hillary Clinton or you know, Muslims or black people or anything." I was like, "I don't think that anything will be like a thing that breaks the camel's back or you know, shocks people into this like." And literally, to be clear, and I think this is also important to note that. Trump has always been a very unpopular political figure. He always has been during his campaign, during his presidency. He lost both elections by millions of votes. He was never had a positive approval rating. But we can, you know, talk. That's a whole different kit and caboodle. To answer your question, I never thought there would be like one story that would just, you know, end it. There maybe the the Access Hollywood tape, just mm-hmm. because it happened right before the election, and it was such a kind of heinous tape to listen to and like we all heard it in his own words yeah i I would say maybe that was the only time where i thought okay maybe this could maybe this will be the thing but um but even then i wasn't 100 percent confident because by then he'd already kind of he'd already he'd already said lots of misogynistic things and stuff but uh yeah so to answer your question no i never really had any uh illusions about that for sure no that's very interesting to look back on it and be like oh if he's not to your point if People don't care that he's like offended and insulted, like what his base lionizes, what his base appreciates, like what his base identifies as. Like they're definitely not going to care if they, he insults uh, people black they don't people. like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. The, like, oh, if you don't care about that, you're definitely not going to care if he makes fun of me. So yeah. that, I mean, that's sad, but so true. I want to jump to like the two places you worked for and not like this isn't going to be like a glass door review or anything, but as we look, over I'll say what first. I can say, and if I don't want to say something, <laughs> I won't say it. But yeah, ask away. Perfect. Ask away. Perfect. Uh, as like the over the last few months, and we talked about layoffs in tech and media kind of being a rite of passage. It seems to have accelerated over the last few months. Insiders laid off staff. Washington Post, New York Times, MTV News, Vice News, BuzzFeed News is gone. Yeah, yeah, gone. 
how does it feel that a place where you like got your start, you did your work, like kind of cut your teeth is they're out of the business, they're gone. But also how does this like, what does it mean as like a sign in the industry that like all of these places are kind of getting out of the business? I want to the first one. How do I personally feel? I mean, I, mean, I was kind of screwed over by BuzzFeed. I, they didn't treat me very well. I was on, I was on Medicaid uh, most of my time at BuzzFeed because they paid me so poorly. Only later in my, uh, about halfway through or six months into BuzzFeed did my boss, um, he really made a big stink. And he was like, Nathan is like breaking good stories. Nathan is like a part of the team. Nathan is doing all this great stuff. And we we're treating him like shit. And that's not okay. When I was like, thank God, I was like, talk about gaslighting. Cause I was like, I <laughs> thought I was being treated like shit. Uh, but I was like, but this is just the way the world works. Right. Um, so, so that, so that bummed me up a little bit, but which is all about to say Buzzfeed. Uh, I had complicated, complicated feelings towards it. Uh, but they did, they did amazing work. Buzzfeed news at its peak. It's like, chef's kiss they were really groundbreaking i was very despite everything i just said i do feel very fortunate to have been able to be on the ground floor and kind of witness this early 21st century explosion in new media that was not necessarily perfect or wasn't figured out and definitely as we've learned not sustainable in many ways but a lot of dare I say, like genius and creativity and brilliance came out of all of that, that bubble that occurred. And so I do feel, I, I feel sad is I guess the short answer. I feel sad that uh, BuzzFeed News particularly went under, but at the same time, I'm not surprised at all. It was, I've, I've definitely had some former colleagues and friends I know say like, oh, isn't this crazy BuzzFeed News shut down? And I'm like, well, it's not crazy. I was like, they've Let's be honest, at the end, it was not, it was there very much a shadow of its former self. Just like Vice is a, has Vice's bankruptcy is imminent, or I forget if they've just declared bankruptcy or they said they're going to declare bankruptcy, but they're also a shadow of their former self. You know, at their peak about, you know, eight to 10 years ago or seven, six years ago, BuzzFeed, Vice, the, the like, they were really hammering out stuff. But since then, between then and now, there's definitely been death by a thousand cuts where it's like layoffs every six months and eventually you're going to run out of people to lay off. And I think that's kind of what happened. I mean, there were layoffs at the, at the end of course, but yeah, so I was sad that it shut down, but I was also sad over the past couple of years, whenever I'd read about a layoff at, at Buzzfeed and I was like, Oh, this is they're killing what was a, a really awesome news outlet, despite its problems. Like whenever BuzzFeed at its peak, I knew some people that would make fun of it. They're like, oh, it's that cat site. Um, and I'm like, shut up. I was like, yeah, I was like, yeah, there are cats <laughs> and stuff. But I'm like, I'm like, just use nuance for a second. I was like, yeah, it's like you, I mean, I was like, NBC shows, you know, random kooky, has like random kooky, like TV shows, sitcoms and stuff. I was like, they also have NBC nightly news. I was like, you know, CBS has so many kooky show they had like three and a half men but they also had 60 minutes like the greatest television journalism product and i think that's ever existed so yeah so i i was sad by buzzfeed uh shutting down and the slow decline of it was very upsetting but um the to your second point of i'm sorry what was your second question again what, what kind of like i see about like the broader trends or yeah like sitting? is this a sign of like that specific maybe structure like kind of a social news is that a sign that that's like never going to be sustainable and then generally like what are the consequences for the news industry at large i i think that honestly was kind of inevitable i think the all of these layoffs and bankruptcies and shutting down were always kind of going to happen no matter what uh just because there was such a big boom and these type of media outlets because everything was so new the technology was new you know like internet social media smartphones uh twitter video like all of these things were exploding on to the economy the broader world economy and nobody could predict the future and people were uh trying to make up things as it happened you know create industries create businesses amidst the chaos 
And I think that a lot of the failures show that there is a uh, a lot of misunderstanding about the way the economy was going and the way this information, digital technology, whatever we want to call this new economy, is going. I think there was a lot of misunderstanding about it because the BuzzFeeds and Vices of the world and their founders, they had this kind of outdated view of being like, oh, we're just going to do like, you know, newspapers or TV or old school type stuff, but on the internet. And it's going to make us like more fun and with it. But it's still a very traditionalist approach, despite the trappings of, you know, bright colors and social media. And the reason the internet and smartphones, social media, for better or worse, they're basically just a massive chaos. And some things, like some people become wildly successful in them. And, and it's really hard to predict, you know, like think about like, you know, Mr. Beast or, you know, these influencers who I'll be honest, I know very little about. But mm-hmm. <laughs> I kind of, I get why they're successful. Like, oh, you can't tell what's going to become the next big thing. And a lot of it is very individualized. It can't be uh, a big corporation that's going to plan the next big thing. Not to dismiss that corporations, you know, play these roles and, you know, cultural impact. But when it comes specifically to social media and the internet and, and the, me- quote, media and journalism, it's tough to to do that within the chaotic system that is the internet as we currently see it today in 2023. And so you do have people that are very successful, but when they are, it's usually them as individuals. It is not a company with hundreds or thousands of employees saying, oh, I think this is going to be the next big thing. And ultimately none of it was ever really too profitable. None of it, it was, I don't want to say never, but very rare that any of these people had profits. It was just the expectation that they would make profits in the future and that we have lots of venture capital money that will get us across that line. But then once that venture capital money started to peter away, that's when the house of cards started to crumble down. Of all the greatness that was that kind of era of media and journalism, which I think is just about over, I think we're entering a new phase, I think so much great stuff was done but if i'm kind of honest i don't think there was a way that it it would have been sustainable because i think the greatness that was achieved was only because there was such an unstable unsustainable uh boom i don't Mm -hmm. think that i think maybe i'll say some of these places could have been managed better and could have like i read an article about how buzzfeed disney tried to buy buzzfeed several years ago for like half a billion dollars and the owner of BuzzFeed was like, no, we're not going to do that. Like, we're going to be the next big, multi- we're going to be the next Disney. We're not going to sell yeah. you. Um, and mm-hmm. I think, speaking of like the misunderstanding about how social media works, I think that's a really good example of it. I think they would have really only done well if they had that sustainability that comes with being part of something bigger. But on the flip side, you wouldn't be able to do half the stuff we did do at BuzzFeed, like all the kooky craziness at BuzzFeed that re- yielded a lot of greatness. Yeah, if you're part of some giant corporation, that never would have happened. So I think the the bust was inevitable. Um, as for you know what I think that means about the future of the media, I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of I'll, I'm I'm pessi- I'm somewhat pessimistic. I'll say mm-hmm. just because there's so much built in chaos in the way that the internet works today, and that the information economy or what whatever we want to call it works today. That the type of structures that allowed institutions to become big media journalism institutions like newspapers or news channels or magazines can't exist in this current in the way things mm-hmm. currently exist like unless there's a massive shakeup or you know, conglomeration it, it, unless something radically changes which you know things do i can't predict the future we didn't know this was going to happen 10 years ago i have a hard time seeing it i'll go even further i am confident um that yeah it's there's, we're not going to have like any big great resurgence. Um, if you because just look at, I mean, the number of people that work in journalism. I think over the last since the year two thousand, it's been like more than fifty percent cut, um, which that's like tens, hundreds of thousands of people. It really reminds me of if you can if you can allow me to be slightly nerdy for a second, as if this was <laughs> already a very nerdy conversation. <laughs> I'm a big history buff. I love history, and I was reading this book about. The early Amer- the like the early American Republic, like post Revolutionary War, and it talked a little about the early Industrial Revolution, 
and how before the industrial revolution and you know factories and stuff existed the way that people would make things like shoes or clothes or whatever industry is uh it would usually be there's like a master and an apprentice and you'd be an apprentice for some a, a cobbler for a shoemaker or an iron worker um in the 1700s and you'd you know maybe live with the guy work with him work under him for like six seven years until eventually you could become a master cobbler or a master textilist and then you would kind of do the same thing but then as the industrial revolution started to happen the apprentices stopped becoming masters masters as they were called would just get lots and lots of apprentices and be like okay now you guys all make the shoes and then like oh we'll do the management the selling and stuff or oh i have this loom that can make 20 times as many dresses as my one dressmaker assistant can and then the people that were on the path of upwards mobility then just became kind of workers think about like what a massive upheaval that must have been like you know for thousands of years this was how people built things and it all happened in, within the span of a generation and at the time people thought it was really crazy people were like oh i i'm stressed out i thought i was going to become i was going to make anvils or whatever and now i'm a permanent wage slave and i think this massive change that we're experiencing in our current economy is somewhat like is very similar to that that's how i view it anyway it's that like we're going through this massive restructuring where the traditional way of doing journalism for the last 150 years within the span of five to 10 years has com been completely flipped on its head. Yeah. And, and it's, it's stressful. It's, it causes anxiety. This is, this seems like a very like trite question to ask after you laid all that out, but like, what are your thoughts on something like Substack? Cause I had like a really dumb idea. I'm going to tell you, I was like, no, what don't say like it's dumb. <laughs> don't, no caveats. I, I'm, I say I'm trying to be better at not caveating but I'm an anxious millennial, so I caveat everything. But I, you know, no caveats. We're not going to say it's dumb until it's proven to be dumb. I, well, I it's been you. proven because I was like, what if there's just like a network of Substack writers that come together? And I was like, oh, that's a newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, haha, -ha, yes, but also haha, -ha, maybe. Um, I think that the future. I, I I actually think you're kind of right. Just the difference is it'll be much smaller than what it was in the past. I think, like I was saying, the way that social media and the internet work today is that it's very individualized. And an individual can become a successful substacker or TikToker or YouTuber. But it's hard to like capture that genie in a bottle for in a for-profit company and just turn out people like that. So I think that actually kind of might I'm not think that's kind of the way we're going. I still think there's going to be big institutions, but they're going to be much smaller, just like they are currently shrinking. And I think in the future, they're not in the future. It currently is happening, um, but I think it will continue to grow and expand. There will be, uh, yeah, people like on Substack, people doing their own report. And I follow a couple of, within the past like year, I followed a couple of writers. And I'll be honest, I did like the free sub stack subscription because I was like, I don't know, these people, we follow each other on Twitter. They're nice. I'll give them like, a f I'll just give them this free follow because that's nothing off my back. And then over time I started reading them. I was like, damn, this is really good stuff. I was like, this is really smart. I was like, I should probably subscribe to them, these people. And I think that, I do think that's the kind of, will play a big future role in great journalism and great reporting. And I could even see it being kind of like what you said, developing into kind of proto networks of uh where it's like okay maybe me i know seven ten twelve other reporters that i really respect and they have their own sub stacks what if we start to like cross promote with each other or what if we give discounts if you subscribe to mine you can get theirs i could see something like that kind of happening as uh things uh coalesce because right now we're in, we're in such an ex everything's exploding around us but after explosions a massive change there is a coalescing where like things start to form out of the mess and i could see that um coming out of the mess um and i think that's also probably the most likely thing i i just the thing is like i said i don't think the the hundreds of thousands of people that have worked in media and have been laid off in the last 20 years uh there's in this future economy there's not going to be room for all of them there's will be a a fraction that do what they did um and that's like the you know the rough to put it mildly, very rough transition. But I, I, I do think there is a future for media. I do think there is a future for journalism. It'll just look very different than what it looks like today and what it has looked like in the past. Uh, but what, what was your, what was your, what's your uh, Substack idea? What was the? What, no, what, that, that, that's now. the idea. Uh, that's the idea. Like, if 
because you mentioned like it's individuals and there's been studies on that too like if you look at elon he has more followers than like tesla it's the individual people are attracted to so like does it that was kind of my hypothesis about like what could be next if all these people now find themselves without like a large corporation as a home base they do it themselves and it's if you have like three sports journalists who have like a sub stack to your point where it's like subscribe or cross promote or whatever. So that's the idea. I think that is also my hypothesis and you validated it. So I, no more millennial caveats. Good, good <laughs> Never in, again. Good. We figured anxiety <laughs> out. Yes. Um, <laughs> but since, since I brought up Elon and we talked about like kind of where Buzzfeed went, how's the role of Twitter changed over your like career? It has changed a lot. I, Try not to caveat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'll say, because it's honest, I am somewhat embarrassed about how much time I do spend on Twitter and have spent on Twitter. Same. Yeah, I've, I've definitely spent less time lately. I'll be honest. I, though I'm not, not going to pretend it's been eliminated from my life. But no, I've been on, I've been on Twitter for 12 years. Um, I go through periods where I tweet a lot and where I don't tweet a lot. I'm kind of currently in a less tweeting phase. But then... You know, the mood strikes every now and then. So for me personally, um, I think it's important to remember Twitter has always been very messy. It's always been rage inducing even before Elon Musk. And so I don't, I'm also not a big fan of nostalgia. So I think it is important to occasionally keep in mind, oh, it wasn't like, you know, we all love Twitter and then Elon came along and ruined it. We could, Twitter had its problems before and, and then Elon came along and made it absolutely much worse um, to be <laughs> fair i'm not saying you know it's bad no matter what we can't blame elon i'm definitely like yeah, yeah. elon definitely made things crazier if right that, which is saying something because it was crazy beforehand uh but no like earlier in my and it still that means it still i think is somewhat helpful i still ha i don't have a massive twitter base but i have a few i have like you know 20 something thousand followers which is not nothing it's not a million but and i forget the value and like reporting but just as a professional tool, I've met lots of great journalists in there. I stay in contact with people that I've met from there or people that I don't even know very well. Uh, if I've replied to their mess, you know, some random joke they make sometimes and they reply to my random joke sometimes. Or they post a very weird niche analysis of a congressional race and I respond even my opinion. It's not best friend or super close relationships or anything, but it's like, okay, it's some semblance of something where I felt comfortable sending them a message or have had somebody feel comfortable sending me a message and be like, hey, I am applying for this gig. Do you have any tips? Or, hey, I am, or just kind of like, you know, shooting the shit one-on-one -on -one behind, behind the scenes about work, uh, about the industry or people telling me like their salaries, me telling people my salaries when they're negotiating. Yeah, forget the talking to the thousands or millions of followers. I think the one-on-one -on -one that can come out of that it has been very helpful. And also, it, God, it used to be so much easier to search. And as somebody who digs through like records, I so many of my stories have come from like scraping social media. And I'm just like, oh, I'm gonna type in you know a a word I know that I'm gonna type in like you know Islam or black or gay or just like words that I know if I search for it in somebody's feed, like somebody that's running for office or appointed for office. That I'm like, I, I can, it's an easy way to check and see what, if they've said like any extremist or, you know, really far out there things. Uh, so as a reporting tool, that was helpful because uh, you kind of know, and I spent so much time also, you know, covering like the rise of the new, like far right, like online and saw so much of that happen online that it was uh, kind of easier back then to search and locate these people. But now it's become such like a, mess of like it seems like it's held together by like chicken wire and duct tape um yeah that like it's impossible to use now uh, the utility you know. of it isn't the same that's what i've been telling yeah, people like, that's a good way of putting it you're gonna have to there's still some really funny things that happen on twitter really funny comments so like that's i that's how i'm approaching it this isn't uh, a utility necessarily anymore like to find out information about stuff or to your point to search stuff or even to keep up with like breaking news. I feel like it used to be you go on Twitter, the trending topics are on point. Like someone has passed away. This is happening locally. That's done. Am I leaving Twitter? No, it still provides some, uh, some humor. 
but yeah, to your point, it was rage inducing before Elon. It's rage inducing now. He's just kind of accelerated like the maybe the decline of like the functionality of it. So that's it. That's it. Um, before we wrap, we're at time. Uh, do you have like time for like one more question? Yeah, yeah. I, I ask. Uh, I'm good with a couple more. If you, I yeah, I still got a bit left, so don't worry about it. Let's pivot to CNN. Let's pivot to CNN. Um, let's pivot to CNN. Uh, big news for CNN over the last few weeks and news generally. I guess like Fox News paid a large settlement to Dominion. They fired Tucker Carlson. CNN fired Don Lemon. But also CNN has been, I mean, making headlines over the last few days because we're talking on May 12th. Donald Trump did a town hall the day after he was found liable of sexual assault and paying E. Jean Carroll. So like, when we talk a big discussion, especially since the 2016 election, and I'm sure before, but that's when I it was really brought to my attention. A big topic in journalism is objectivity, like managing your bias in the reporting. How do you think that has changed over the last few years? And like, how do you, what do you think it means that CNN is like, hey, come on down, uh, Donald, to talk about whatever i didn't watch i i didn't engage and like twitter was useless i think most people i think most people didn't watch. like the i mean it had good ratings i think three million people watched but um which is good for cable television i think they're like it's like a fraction of what his town halls were in 2016 but to your question of how do i think the concepts of object objectivity and bias have changed the last few years i'll say i don't think they've changed which you know, might be kind of a problem. Yeah, anyway, that's a bit of an overly simplistic response. I'm because again, we're talking about the media air quotes, which is a very big, broad. The media covers Substack. The media covers CNN. The media covers New York Times. The media covers some blogger on Tumblr. I do think that um, I think the in these institu- big institutions like CNN and New York Times have wedded so much of their identity to being like in a th- quote authority on the news. Uh, which I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with that. I, I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with trying to be an objective reporter. And I'll be honest, it's still kind of my, it's kind of, it's very, it's kind of passe amongst our generation and Gen Z. I feel younger people where it's like, oh, okay, this is kind of like a silly, stupid thing. Like, you know, no, but you're just going to pretend that you don't understand the difference between right and wrong or that you don't understand what morals are. And which I, I understand that criticism and I think it is valid at times. Um, but I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with aspiring for that type of reporting. I will say that I still think the New York Times is the greatest journalistic outlet in the world right now. Um, I don't agree with everything they do. And I don't agree with all of their decisions. But, um, you know, they if you have a newspaper, it's going to have like 250 stories in it. And if you know, one or two, I'm like, Oh, that's stupid. I don't think you should throw out the whole baby with the bathwater, but I understand, you know, I understand why some people would disagree. So I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with uh, that type of reporting. I just, I do think that it can always be finessed and that there are times when, uh, I said, I have a, I have a non-disparagement clause in my uh, CNN contract. So I'm not going <laughs> to say, not that I'm going to like, you know, take a shit all over them or anything. Cause also right. their own, their own reporting you know, yesterday has also said, oh, lots of people at CNN are pissed off about this, or so. Uh, so I'm not going to, you know, take a dump all over them. So I'll try to word it from a slightly analytical view. Mm-hmm. But I do think there is that fear, especially from management. I think it's much more from management than reporters. But there are definitely some reporters where it's such a theoretically noble aspiration to be like oh i am a wise all-seeing emotionless this is what happened and i'm going Mm -hmm. to report it very accurately and very fact-based you know that that makes sense that sounds like it's a really good thing to aspire to but the real world is messy and complicated and we come to these views of what is unemotional unbiased based off of bias (laughs) bias <laughs> uh, yeah. to some degree <laughs> like the idea that it's also kind of like a history example but the idea that uh things shouldn't we shouldn't change at the whims of people's emotions and changing in society um that belies the fact that the point we're at now where is based off of generations of decisions and bias and um and that the present status quo didn't come about because of its perfectness it was because 
it's a result of centuries and generations of beliefs and shifts in cultural views. So, which is all, I don't realize this is all becoming very esoteric. But <laughs> uh, objectivity, it's, I, I don't think there's a need for every objective quote article to include the reporter saying at the end, by the way, I personally think this is stupid. So I want to be honest in the sake of transparency. I don't really think that's necessary. And though I've said these great things about theoretically perfect objectivity, um, even though it doesn't really exist, we all we all carry our own biases. I think that's fine to acknowledge. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing to feel that way. Uh, but I still think there's great, you know, there's really great crusading reporting. There's really great, you know, the New Yorker has, you know, 10,000 word investigative pieces where it's very clear the person values, the writer values one subject over the other. They're trying to paint this person as the hero, this person is the villain, this person's corrupt and evil, this person's, you know, striving against the big guy and we're supposed to root for them. That's that's clearly bias, um, but it's not a bad thing. Like that, it's just a different type of reporting. It's uh, crusading reporting. I think crusading reporting is great and phenomenal and can be just as that can be often is just as valuable as uh, some of this more traditional New York Times style reporting um, where it's a bit drier. So I, I think there's definitely room for all types of reporting from super biased to super kind of dry. But I think the problem comes when the quote like dry quote objective reporting becomes a bit to up its own ass and self-importance <laughs> um, because yeah. reflection's always good. Reflection's good. Sometimes struggle growth comes through struggle. Growth comes through, you know, like embarrassing yourself and like making change and like learning. And I don't think it's a coincidence that some of these biggest, longest institutions that have wedded most of their identity to objectivity quote is, uh, I don't think it's a coincidence that they're the ones that have like the hardest time admitting to mistakes or errors growth is hard okay i i lied uh i apologize <laughs> last question for real everybody if you like this episode please leave a review i will include nathan's information to follow him if yeah rate, rate, rate and review people rate and review yes and then and nathan's information so you can follow him if he's ever in a tweety mood but my absolute last question is about the elizabeth holmes piece in the new york times you mentioned earlier that like there's a lot of discussion about the news as opposed to like actually discussing. Are, are you talking about the one where it's like, look how much she's changed? Yeah, and I don't know <laughs> if she's telling the truth, then maybe she is, but I trust her now. So it, it was really weird to read, and I it was almost like a go back to Twitter being rage inducing. It was almost like a hate read because it's like I don't believe her. I do feel like she's like a snake oil saleswoman talking to this reporter. But like, what what place does that have? As a journalist, as a reader, like what? So, you're, say, you're, so you're saying, Nathan, do you think this story is complete bullshit and stupid? <laughs> yeah, I mean, essentially, yes. Um, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 I will say, uh, excellent. I, I'm a reporter. I, I like straight to the um, yes. cut to the chase. I said a few minutes ago, I think the New York Times does lots of great work, and I think occasionally they do <laughs> stories that I think are stupid. Um, yeah. I, I, I did say that. Honestly, it doesn't really. It doesn't really enrage me too much because this is like a thing that happens and more it's just kind of slightly embarrassing to me um because i'm like dude you know you you're making a fool of yourself but that does happen i'm sure i've done stories that i think were that i cringed at later um but they usually weren't you know multi-thousand word rehabilitation pieces to be clear in my defense Right. Um, so yeah, I think there is, as much as we talked about reporting and reporting the facts, one thing we didn't really talk too much about or that sometimes gets lost in discussion of media is that storytelling is so important. Like facts and reporting and getting so-and-so said this, so-and-so did this are such core aspects of reporting. They're the core aspect of reporting. But journalists love a good story. They love a good narrative. People, and I think that's just people. Forget drugs, yeah. humans. It's in our, you know, we've been telling oral traditions since, you know, we were in caves and painting on the walls. Stories are a huge part of journalism and it's a huge part of this human experience. And I think that uh, individuals, especially writers, especially journalists, because they write a lot and they tell stories in the lust for such a great narrative that becomes maybe a bit more overriding 
than the, uh, quote, social value or value of the piece. If it's like, oh, what a, like, a gorgeous, beautiful story, um, which I'll be I read half of half of it. I didn't finish it because I was like, I don't think this is adding value to my life. Um, <laughs> you made I, the right I, choice for yeah. sure. Uh, I, I will just say that I think, yeah, like I said, people like stories. P- people like to tell stories and writers really like to tell a story that they think is just, you know, amazing. And sometimes it's not. And, you know, sometimes people do that. And it's, uh, it, it's happened before. It will definitely happen again. I think it's good that people call it out when it does happen. But yeah, I, th- I I think it's one of the inherent aspects of journalism for, I should say for better or worse, but for, for, for worse. But, you know, because of that drive, sometimes you get really good stories. And if we just eliminated that drive altogether, you know, we wouldn't have such wonderful stories. So humans are complex. Sometimes we write stupid things. <laughs> yes. Well, <laughs> not, never me, though. Not me. Never. 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 Me. <laughs> never. I've <laughs> never released a bad episode. You've never written a bad article. We are, we are, we are perfect. We're above it all. But Nathan... Um, thank you so much. This was, I really appreciate like the nuance and kind of like context you added to the conversation about journalism, because I think people have a lot of complicated, oh, maybe, or sometimes maybe not so complicated. I, like, that's the, I don't about, think people like, have enough complicated. I think yeah, people are yeah. too simplistic about it. Uh, very, <laughs> very simplistic about like the media and the role they play. And like, to your point, to all of your points about like your bias and like your personality and like the, the storytelling aspect of it, I think people do, um, do lose sight of that. So this was, this was great and informative for me too. I had a great Thank you so much for having me on. This was, yeah. uh, yeah, great questions. If anything else to add, or we can just let the people go. Uh, uh, anything else to add? Uh, no. So I'll teach you my information. Follow me on Twitter at Nate McDermott. At Nate McDermott. Um, and yeah, I'm sure you Ryan will put some of the other stuff in there. But no, yeah, this was. I, I had a great time. I really like. I like nuance. I like context, and I really appreciate that. Uh, you, yeah, do as well, and that you allowed me to talk about it and stuff. So thank you. Oh, yeah. I mean, I learned just as much. This podcast is an exercise in me trying to figure out, figure things out. So everybody, you know what that is? Thanks for listening. (laughs) Growth. Growth. We're growing.